Very good question to start out on. And ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, before I introduce our panelists, just a brief word on what our panel is not going to do. We are not going to try to second guess the proceedings in the US and decide whether or not the findings there were correct or whether they should be revised in October. As m many of you probably know, they will be up for confirmation or revision in October. We are not gonna, going to delve into that in detail, and we are not also going to say what the EU ought to do with the investigation that's before it, because if we did either of those things, we would undoubtedly be discussing until midnight tonight. So we're going to avoid doing that. We are going to try to look at the big picture, the global picture, and also to talk about how to keep trade on track, whatever that might mean to you, and we'll be talking about what that might mean to different people, and how to facilitate trade opportunities in a globalized market. So with that disclaimer, as it were, let me now move on to introduce our panelists. And once again, we do have Giovanni De Santi on, uh, on our panel, and I'll just remind you of what it is he does, because I heard that some people were not entirely clear on the JRC's function. He is the head of the Institute for Energy and Transport at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. That means he's responsible for coordinating key energy activities, and as I understand it, the Institute does provide energy backup research uh, for the Commission as a whole. Am I right about that? Right. Yes? Very good. We also have on our panel now Bjorn Emde. He is Suntech's European spokesperson. He's in charge of government relations, media, and policy. He also chairs the communications working group at the AP EPIA. And prior to joining Suntech, he served as advisor to a leading global private equity investor with portfolio companies in the clean tech sector in all kinds of companies whose names are e household names, but I'm not going to list them all. <laughs> Anyan Ghosh is Senior General Manager and s of Sales and Marketing at Tata BP Solar India. He uh, currently focuses on large PV projects and developing global markets. He has two decades of solar experience, and his company, Tata Power Solar, was earlier a BP solar joint venture and is now 100% owned by the Tata Group. And by the way, I've forgotten to applaud for um, the two of you, but we'll applaud everybody at once at the end to save time. How is that? <laughs> Winfried Hoffmann is also with us. He is the current president of the EPIA. He's a pioneer in the European solar industry. He spent more than 30 years working in photovoltaics, sits on a number of supervisory boards, including those of SMA Solar Technology, the Institute for Solar Energy Research in Hamel, and the Helmholtz Institute in Berlin. And as I understand it, you are also a prize winner today of the Becquerel Prize. Congratulations on that. <laughs> you get that extra applause. <laughs> 10 seconds. <laughs> we also have with us Paula Mintz. She is Principal Analyst in the PV Services Program and Director in the Energy Practice at Navigant. She's widely recognized as an industry expert on photovoltaic technologies and markets, and she's also the primary author and executive editor of the Solar Outlook Market Newsletter. And last but not least, Eric Peters, sorry, not last, but, uh, and not least. <laughs> Eric Peters is uh, Global Solar Executive Director, uh, responsible for Dow Corning's uh, electronics business now, but was previously Global Solar Executive Director, Vice President at Dow Corning Solar Solutions, which is in charge of developing and commercializing material solutions for the photovoltaics industry. And he also was responsible for the overall strategic direction and operation of Dow Corning Solar Business around the world. But as I say, three weeks ago, he changed position and is now in the electronics area, so maybe he can draw some parallels for us later on. And finally, Stefan Rink is president and CEO of Singulus Technologies, which is a supplier of manufacturing solutions for crystalline and thin film solar technologies. And he was previously chairman of the management board at Linda Material Holding. He joined Singulus three years ago. So welcome to all of you. I'd like to, exactly. I'd like to start out by picking up on Murray Cameron's question, perhaps with a bit of a twist. He basically told us trade wars are a game changer, possibly even a game ender. I would put it to you that how you see the trade issue depends on what position you're playing in the game and what game it is that you think you're playing. In other words, that this very much depends perhaps on a firm's particular position 
in the value chain. And let me start out with you, uh, Mr. Hoffman. If we look at that burgeoning European market that has been described several times, sorry, that has been <laughs> described several times today, what share of the value of total installed systems, total installed systems in Europe is attributable to those Chinese modules that are at the focus of this dispute as opposed to the European PV industry taken as a whole? Okay, so <coughs> let me try to um, clarify uh, those numbers because very often if you simply take uh, the 21 gigawatts installed in 2011, just take the last year's installation in Europe, which makes a total of value anywhere in the range of 48 billion euro. And then you ask uh, how many of the 21 uh, gigawatt of modules installed are coming from Europe and then the number is less than 10 percent and many are coming from Asia. So here you have then a big discussion about that little and an end. Now in 2011 and we will have a paper uh, during that conference on Friday exactly on that issue, we looked throughout the whole value chain and looked to all the companies in Europe who are doing business and that not only producing modules but material producers um, in the whole uh, chain like silver pastes, like plastics and many things more, like equipment. Then we have the component manufacturers, not only for wafer cells and modules but also for inverters. Then we have the balance of systems. And then of course we have downstream then all the integration and uh, finance issues and an end. Now if you sum up in 2011 the turnover of the solar companies in Europe, which value did they create in that year, just in terms of turnover, that was about two-thirds of the mentioned value before. So much more than the less than 10% as it is very often discussed. Now having said that, we have to be very clear that this is a situation which was true in 2011 but may not stay constant as we move forward into the future. So I am still heavily uh, pressing the various politicians, the Commission and an end to really find suitable ways to also have in the future a strong policy in Europe for throughout the value chain um, also uh, production issues because I was involved two years ago in a high level group uh, which was started by three commissioners and uh, by the way that was the same finding which we heard uh, later by the US uh, government that if in a particular industry you are not trying to have also mass production of important components then sooner or later you have also no longer a possibility to do research in that area. So therefore you really have to take the larger picture to see how things are developing in the future and I'm pretty sure that is something which we will have a nice discussion on. Giovanni Di Santi, the phenomenon that we're looking at here, the supply chain, the value chain, fragmentation, increasing internationalization, production getting sliced thinner and thinner and thinner. This is by no means a phenomenon unique to the solar industry. We've seen it in a number of different industries. How difficult does it become under such circumstances to determine the real breakdown of value added? Mm. But let's say, first of all, also following what Joss Winfrey said, I think that Europe always had a very open attitude for collaboration, for developing cooperation with different continents. So it's clear that in that respect we will continue in a way that we need to find a global solution. Because again, this is not only for PV, it's true for many other energy uh, technology. We need to have a continuous dialogue in order to maximize synergies with East, of course with our traditional partners, US, Japan, but also now in the dialogue with Africa. So it's clear that for our industry, it becomes more and more important that we open this frontier, we find a solution to make it more and more competitive. Again, for example, I'm, 20 days from now, I'm going in Ghana 
there is a high level energy forum between EU and Africa in the, in the frame of the Energy for All initiative of, of UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And there again, we want to reinforce this message. We want to find a way how to get profit from the different opportunities that we do have locally, but also the technology that we can export, the technology that we can improve in Europe and worldwide. So if I can maybe just give you an example with another slide I do have prepared, the, the, the last, just, this is what also Winfred mentioned before. If you look at the breakdown of the cost, overall cost of the PV system, as he said, you see that on the left hand side, you, you do see the, the part of the, of the cake which remains in Europe, which is about two thirds, as he correctly said, and one third is linked to the PV module itself, which is basically in Asia. Now, there you see all the opportunities to improve and to increase, first of all, to reduce the cost, which means, again, as we said before, to improve technology, so innovation, but also to find intelligent innovation, intelligent system, for example, for the all the balance systems, so the non-PV modules, but those what is behind the connections, as I said before, to the grid, and also, finally, also the adaptation of the PV system, because don't forget that now, for example, Europe has developed this new directive, net zero energy building directive. So it will be important that in the future, after 2018, all the new buildings will be zero absorbing energy. And then, then it's clear that the PV will play an important role. So we are stimulating also possible incentive measures to stimulate again advanced research, advanced innovation to reduce the cost, but also to make the PV more and more 